Hello, I'm Dan Sullivan, Acting Director of Multifamily Production here at FHA in HUD headquarters. Our training today and tomorrow will provide a basic overview of environmental requirements for HUD staff reviewing FHA mortgage insurance applications under the various multifamily FHA programs. We'll be meeting today and tomorrow from 9.30 a.m. till the end of the day, 4.30, or if it goes over, perhaps till 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. This training will be archived and serve as a resource for years to come. For those of you participating in real time today by webinar, I'd like to pause and ask you to pick up your dumb phone and turn it off. You may have one of these smartphones. I'd like you to take it and put it in listen-only mode and stick it in your drawer or your briefcase so that you're not distracted. Um, we ask that you focus on the training for the next two days. We will take breaks, um, but we really don't want you to be multitasking. If you have questions, send them by email to me at daniel.j.sullivan at hud.gov. We have uh, Laura Seltzer, our in summer intern, will be tallying them and teeing them up for the panelists. I'd like to thank Daniel Shoup in the Office of Environment and Energy and CPD um, for working with us to schedule and plan this training. We actually started talking about it two or three years ago as we were working in the multifamily transformation. And then uh, in the last eight months, uh, various staff have been working together to plan this training. I'd particularly like to thank Liz Zapeta, who has really led the effort from CPD's side, and Stefan Tomatos, our program environmental clearance officer, and Rick Shaw from Housing in New York, who have worked very hard in developing this training over the last eight months. These introductory sessions are aimed at HUD's multifamily underwriters and technical specialists, appraisers and architects, who have not previously been trained in environmental law or regs. And as a refresher for people who have, may have had such training or have such experience, um, our uh, uh, Office of Recapitalization has been uh, doing environmental reviews by their underwriters for the last year or so using the HEROES system. With the transformation and the recent HEROES training provided uh, for all multifamily production staff, we want to offer this training, which should be taken by all multifamily production field office staff in the regional centers and satellite offices as well in HUD headquarters. We'll be asking supervisors to document each staff that has participated in the training in its entirety. So we ask that you give your full attention to the training, and I'm going to put my cell phones away to do likewise, and ask that you do the same. Give your full attention to the training, if a conflict arises, make it up as soon as possible by viewing the webcast archive. After participating in this orientation to HEROES system, which Liz presented a month or two ago and is available on webcast, and this two-day training, we expect you to have the necessary basic familiarity and understanding of environmental policy and what problems may arise so that you can review environmental reports that are submitted with applications in order to process a request for multifamily mortgage insurance. Um, typically, 800 out of the 1,000 deals we do a year, projects do not have complex or significant environmental contamination or compliance problems. Um, but the task is to know when you need to refer such reports and projects that do have such problems or technical complicated issues to more experienced technical staff, such as the designated lead person in each multifamily technical support division, or perhaps the CPD field or regional environmental clearance officer, or occasionally our housing program environmental clearance officer. 
environmental hazards, contamination, and programmatic non-compliance in the area of environmental laws and regs are among the most serious risks that we need to evaluate and mitigate when we're looking at FHA mortgage insurance applications. With the department's emphasis on recapitalizing our affordable housing stock, the focus on transit-oriented urban development, and just the sheer volume of market rate transactions that we've been seeing, uh, more deals and transactions have been coming up with environmental issues. At the same time, the OIG, the Office of Inspector General, did an audit a year or so ago, mainly on public housing projects, but on CPD and really the whole department scrutiny, and concluded that HUD had not been doing a sufficient job to complete environmental reviews satisfactorily, and that adequate training on environmental review requirements had not been provided. As I mentioned, with the multifamily transformation, we had recognized this need for environmental training, so we've been planning this for a long time. Environmental problems can threaten the health and safety of residents. They can represent an unacceptable financial risk and thus be inappropriate for mortgage insurance under FHA's programs. And as a practical matter, if those aren't big enough issues, they will significantly delay loan approval. Often such problems can be mitigated and resolved, but we don't take them casually, and thus this training really is important. After providing an overview of the various environmental statutory and regulatory authorities, as well as Chapter 9 of the MAP Guide, various training segments will be presented to address the issues that can come up in this area. The presentations will describe what is and isn't required depending on the program type. As you know, we have three basic program types, Section 223A7 refinancings with little or no repairs. Those will require little or no environmental review. Section 223F refinancing loans, which do require an environmental review, at least a limited one. And then the various new construction and substantial rehabilitation programs, which require full environmental review. Environmental issues should be identified when the field staff conducts your initial screening and then discussed with the underwriting and tech support branch chiefs. If the transaction has greater than 200 units or there are significant or complicated environmental issues, the field or regional environmental clearance officer should be contacted as early as practicable and provide, 30, provide them with 30 days to review and comment on the information that is available at that stage. Often this is an iterative process when we have complicated or problematic environmental issues and so there's some back and forth and the idea is to identify those as early as possible. I want to thank you for participating in this training, and we ask now that you provide your full attention for the next two days. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Liz Zepeda and Stefan Tomatos, who will be conducting the training. They'll go over the agenda and the schedule, and again, if you have questions, send them to my email at daniel.j.sullivan at hud.gov. Thank you. Liz, do you want to uh, just introduce and maybe walk through the schedule generally and who will be presenting over the next two days? Sure. Um, so I believe you have the agenda. It was sent out with the multifamily production monthly call um, documents last week. Uh, so we're going to start this morning with going over some general requirements in the Map Guide Chapter 9 and Part 50. Um, 24 CFR Part 50 of our regulations at HUD. Um, and then starting this afternoon, we're going to get into specific compliance requirements um, with all of the 16 related environmental laws and authorities that HUD projects have to comply with. Um, and then moving into tomorrow afternoon, we'll look at some case studies and get into specific questions um, and look at some specific projects um, and how to um, deal with these compliance issues on uh, multifamily housing projects. Um, 
I think that's about it. Turn it back over to you. Okay. Stefan. Okay. Uh, Liz, could you briefly just walk through who the presenters are? They do have the schedule, but just announce from CPD who will be speaking over the next two days. Sure. Sorry. Um, I'm Liz Zapata. I'm with the Office of Environment and Energy. Uh, we're in CPD, but we're the Departmental Compliance Office for HUD. Um, I'm an environmental specialist in that office, and we'll be joined by several other people from the Office of Environment. Um, in headquarters, uh, Danielle Shoup is the director of our office, of the Office of Environment and Energy. Um, Barbara Britton is the director of the Environmental Review Division, and she'll be presenting on contamination issues and explosive hazards uh, this afternoon. Uh, and Jim Potter, um, also from Office of Environment headquarters, will be presenting on noise, I believe, tomorrow morning. And then we're really lucky to be joined by Laura Myers, who is the field environmental officer in Fort Worth. Uh, she came into DC to help us with a variety of topics and to kind of uh, provide commentary throughout. So Laura is a great field resource with a lot of on the ground experience. Uh, I think, oh, Nancy Boone. Also Nancy Boone from the Office of Environment headquarters uh, is our federal and preservation officer. And she'll be presenting this afternoon as well. And I really hope I didn't miss anyone else. I think that's it for Office of Environment. Okay. And Stefan and Rick, could you just introduce yourselves and just a word on your background? And, and then we'll turn it over to Stefan to start the presentation. OK. Uh, my name is Stefan Tomatos. I'm the acting uh, program environmental clearance officer for housing. Uh, my official duties are in the Office of uh, Architecture and Engineering in uh, the healthcare program. Uh, I'm a civil engineer uh, and I have a significant environmental background. But, um, and I'll be presenting just an overview of the program, um, the requirements that we have uh, in terms of uh, environmental compliance and clearance for housing. Um, and, um, Thanks. And Rick? Hi, I'm Frederick Shaw. I'm with the Office of Housing, Multifamily in New York, New York City. Uh, I have 17 years of commercial appraisal experience uh, with HUD, um, most of it in New Jersey, uh, an environmentally free site uh, and state. Um, with that background, uh, I've spent a lot of time on the ground uh, completing environmental reviews, reading phase ones, and I'm basically here to give you an on the ground uh, overview of the map guide and some of uh, the rules and regs and procedures on how to go through uh, your environmental compliance. Rick mentioned he's had years on the ground and I'm reminded back in 1991 or 92 I attended environmental training in HUD headquarters. I was a multi-family housing rep in the Seattle field office. And Jack Bonkowski was Stefan's predecessor's predecessor's predecessor. And he did the training. And he mentioned that environmental work is, is important to be on the ground. Indeed, his view was that if you're doing an environmental review, you needed to be on site and taste the dirt. He recommended a teaspoon and putting it in your jaw because you can learn a lot by figuring out what's in the dirt. That may have been a, a, a metaphor and extreme example or, or recommendation, but the point is that we do, in, in evaluating real estate, it really is a dirt business. We expect some HUD staff to be on site for every 223F and D4 or new construction sub rehab. Um, typically, it will be the person completing the env environmental review um, based on the lenders and their uh, uh, consultants' due diligence. Uh, occasionally, workload share may require splitting that responsibility, um, but that would be the exception, not the rule. And uh, uh, we would uh, expect that the person completing the hero's submission then is thoroughly briefed by whoever uh, did the site review on their behalf. Normally, though, the person doing the environmental review and entering the heroes will be the person that got to taste the dirt, or if it's an existing building, hang out in the laundry room on Friday night, which is where you find out what's really happening on site. And with that, Stefan, the floor is yours to go over the next segment of our training. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we'll go, uh, I'm going to present a little bit about the, um, an overview of the whole uh, environmental program as uh, it comes together for housing. And the, oh, okay. 
So um, a little background now on the regulations and guidance. I think uh, Dan did a great job in kind of introducing us, uh, but um, I do have a few slides I want to go through. Uh, so basically, we want to provide a safe and clean housing uh, away from any noise, uh, noisances and hazards. Um, when I say clean, I mean clean in terms of uh, how we, we look at the environment that's around our housing. Uh, nothing to be uh, environment, no environmental hazards. Uh, we also want to minimize the risk for HUD, and it is a financial exposure for uh, any cleanup or negative in impacts in terms of the health of, um, of, the, of the people living in these housing, um, uh, the, this, these developments. Uh, we also want to prevent negative impact on the environment as a general rule. Now, the fact that we have, uh, we have to follow uh, uh, federal regulations, kind of, uh, they're, they're more stringent than uh, private. Uh, regulations that the private people have to follow, so uh, we might be a little more stringent on that. Uh, there is a lot of help available for the people that are conducting the envir these environmental reviews. Um, the Office of Energy and Environment and CPD is kind of responsible for the overall program. Uh, they, give a, they give us guidance. Uh, we follow the field environmental officers and the regional environmental officers. Um, they're the people that we kind of rely on to give us guidance on these regulations. Uh, they uh, report directly back to CBD, but they are uh, kind of responsible for the regions uh, and the field offices. Uh, so anytime we have questions, we'll go to them. Uh, we also have the headquarter experts. Um, I think some of them are actually going to be here with us today to present on the various topics that, that we go through. Um, the, it's the, the names of the, the field environmental officers, the regional officers, and the, the experts in the headquarters are all available online. And uh, it'll be nice if you can uh, refer to this, the list and, um, um, and, and have them available. Uh, for multifamily, uh, we have the local subject matter experts uh, and the program environmental clearance officer. Um, I'm the acting environmental clearance officer for now, and um, some of the questions will come to the local, the local experts and then come to the, 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 the program environmental clearance officer. Uh, however, we do rely heavily on the field and the regional officers for CPD uh, for their guidance on uh, implementation um, issues for some of the regulations. Um, also, uh, as mentioned in Chapter 9 in the MAP Guide, uh, the applicant is the person that has to hire a professional, and a lot of the questions that we have to answer uh, could be, uh, are facilitated by whatever the, the applicant provides uh, through the, this professional opinion that's uh, submitted to, um, to, to us. Just a word on the word uh, definition of applicant. We expect the lender to be uh, providing us the third party due diligence. Unlike appraisers and their third party architectural analysts, we don't limit it. So it could be that you have a borrower that has actually hired the third party due diligence professional. In that event, we would require a more rigorous review by the lender. And regardless, in the vast majority of cases, the lender in our uh, context is always the applicant and for purposes of the environmental review, we expect the lender to have hired a third party professional with qualifications, education and competence in doing an environmental review for, HUD's, uh, for HUD to consider. Thank you. Uh, there is a provision for waivers. Uh, the map guide is, in a sense, uh, it's e the, the housing, the multifamily um, kind of uh, interpretation of the regulations. Uh, we do have um, some regulations in there that are kind of above and beyond what will be uh, considered part of CPD. So we do have a process where some of these regulations can be waived. Um, the, that waiver is a lot easier to get than what we would, e we, we would require if, it, uh, if it's an actual uh, regulatory waiver. That has to go through CPD, and that's something that we don't like to take uh, lightly. So uh, a good example of that would be, for example, uh, uh, radon uh, issues that we have to follow. Um, some of the regulations that we have in the MAP guide are our interpretations of the standards. Uh, it's a lot easier for us to look at case-by-case uh, -case studies and um, situations on the ground that we would, we would, al we would allow to, um, uh, to waive these requirements or kind of um, uh, waive the, the, the way we uh, implement the requirements. 
Uh, a regulatory issue for CPD would be, for example, something that has to do with a floodplain. Uh, that's something that, that we, we would not recommend um, to, to go through the, the process of getting a waiver. Uh, that would be something that we would uh, reject. So just a uh, um, further commentary on this issue. Regulations can only be waived by an assistant secretary. That means if it's a housing reg, it's the FHA commissioner has to be the one that waives the reg. In the area of environment, the assistant secretary for CPD uh, has responsibility and, and is the official that gives the reg waivers. So the principal deputy assistant secretary, Harriet Tregoning, would be the person that would be required to wa uh, would be requested to waive a CPD regulation. For items that Stefan referenced in the map guide that are programmatic, um, I think lead-based paint and asbestos and radon, it's not that we take those less seriously than other hazards or, or uh, environmental compliance issues, but rather the authority to waive the requirements in the rare cases that's appropriate is, is delegated to the regional director of the uh, uh, five regional offices. Um, consult with headquarters, uh, either Stefan or headquarters tech support um, division when you think a, a waiver is appropriate. Uh, as you, I think, are probably aware, regulatory waivers take quite a while, and so uh, not only do we not take them lightly, uh, just assume in planning and a discussion with the lender and the developer that those will take a long time to get done. Uh, one, actually, one more item that I think I'm going to mention a little later. There, there is a, a specific uh, way of getting uh, some, a noise waiver, but I, we're going to talk about that. Um, a little bit about the process that we're, that, that's usually followed in terms of getting an application through and getting it approved. Uh, a lot of times we have a pre-concept meeting for a multifamily application. Uh, this is a good time to kind of introduce this issue of environmental requirements to the, uh, the applicant. Uh, the map guide, chapter nine specifically of the map, the map guide is, uh, is kind of the framework of, that, of what we follow in terms of the environmental uh, regulations. Um, it is good to advise them to refrain from making any kind of choice limiting actions. Uh, we don't want them to start going into their, their property and, and making uh, changes or uh, any type of alterations that would be permanent and uh, would kind of prevent them from getting approval. Um, example of that would be if they go in and, and uh, have any impact on wetlands or floodplains that are on their property. Uh, so anything that would prevent future uh, review or uh, anything that would be non-reversible uh, would, would be something that would um, require us to reject, it, uh, reject their project. Also, we do advise them to hire professionals. Uh, a lot of the people that, uh, that, that are going to be looking at these projects um, need to be professionals uh, and, and the, the documents they provide uh, have to be uh, according to their map, our map guide requirements. Uh, also, there is an issue of timing. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of these regulations that we have uh, have requirements in terms of, in terms of time. Uh, the floodplain issue, for example, uh, we're going to talk about this uh, later today. Uh, there is a process that's called the eight-step process. Uh, it could take a, a month, maybe two months to go through. Uh, also, there might be issues of a cont contamination. Uh, we might need to go in and do additional testing, additional sampling. Um, the phase, a phase one environmental uh, site assessment might be required. Uh, noise waivers are also very time consuming if they need uh, those. So uh, a pre-concept meeting would be the best time to kind of uh, familiar, familiarize the, uh, the applicant about this, uh, these requirements and let them understand that this might um, introduce a delay in what they have as their timeline. Um, also, how can you help? Um, are, is there anything that, that you think is unusual about their project? Uh, any kind of questions that you can ask that would uh, ring a bell for the applicant and uh, give them advice? Um, the chapter nine is, is basically uh, all we need to follow in terms of uh, the regulations. On the last point, could you go back to that? just want to emphasize when you're having a concept meeting, often the lender and the borrower will be looking to HUD, and yet 
by definition at that stage, we don't have complete information. So it is appropriate to ask, are there any environmental issues? Uh, and if there are, give them advice on how that will be handled. Do not please make promises or give assurance. Um, everything will work out fine. Sometimes it doesn't. Now, of the 1,000 deals a year we look at, 800 don't have any issues, or if there were issues, they're fully documented and mitigated. Maybe 20% have some issue that has to be worked through. Uh, 2 to 5% in my experience, things are not all right, and they either derail the project or just take extended periods of time. So be careful at concept meeting. We want to be helpful, but we're also not underwriting. We're not giving a formal review at that stage. The concept meeting is uh, when you get most uh, more information about your project. Uh, also, uh, as project as this is uh, applicable, I'm not sure if all projects go through the concept meeting. So, so most pro uh, the refinancings typically don't require or have a concept meeting. The lender is encouraged and welcome if there are unusual issues, which could include environmental. Uh, the vast majority of new construction and substantial rehab deals do have a concept meeting, and then that's the time to bring up at any known environmental conditions. Okay. Uh, this is actually a good time for you to invite your um, uh, prog program environmental clearance officer, uh, also your local subject matter experts, if you think that there is anything problematic for your project. Uh, new construction projects that have more than 200 units, you need to get the local uh, field environmental officer or the regional environmental officer involved. Uh, since the environmental review for projects with uh, those the over 200 units need to have final approval from CBD, the Office of Environment and Energy. The pre-app or firm application package, that's where you basically get all the information you need to review your, um, your project. Um, again, you have to try to get as much information from this, uh, the application as possible. Uh, you have to go through the lender's narrative, uh, the phase one ESA, uh, one thing good sometimes we get uh, environmental uh, we get phase ones that don't meet our requirements so this is where uh, that 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 question comes up uh, does it meet our requirements in terms of what actually is required what is requested in the map guide uh, also the lenders environmental report all these uh, the three documents have everything you need to know uh, in terms of what the applicant will provide uh, is there anything unusual about your site? Um, again, invite your local subject matter expert and the uh, program environmental clearance officer and have a discussion with them if there is something that you see uh, that could be problematic for this application. Again, over 200 units, you need to get a signature from the field environmental officer or the regional environmental officer for CPD. A little bit about the map guide. Uh, chapter 9. Uh, mentions the what is what we call the categorically excluded uh, projects. Uh, these are uh, projects that won't have to follow uh, NEPA requirements. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the um, the form, the, the environmental form that we have, 4128, uh, this is uh, how we kind of define the difference between Part A and Part B. Uh, the question is Part A by B. I'm not going to go through this in more detail because we're going to uh, be discussing it for the next two days. Uh, 223F uh, purchases or refinance of existing projects. Uh, this is um, th this is only uh, ones that allow for routine maintenance. Um, these um, these are categorically excluded. So basically, I'm going through the two uh, projects that are categorically excluded. Uh, I think I'm going to actually leave this to be discussed when we go through the specific uh, map guide questions. Yeah, but pause before we go on. If you're like me, you struggle with acronyms. Indeed, I invented an acronym, AAWP, which means avoid acronyms wherever possible. Unfortunately, just because of the technical nature of our programs, that really is not possible. One of the ones you'll see is CE. And so what I do when I'm at my desk and reviewing this material is I take a post-it and I write CE on it in a line and write categorically excluded. Okay, and so as noted, this is for refinancings that are not subject to complete uh, environmental reviews. And yet, refinancings are subject to some level of environmental review. Is that an accurate assessment? It's pretty accurate, and I'll spend a lot more time on this okay, later so this we'll morning. we'll be coming back to that. <laughs> but 
CE, Categorically Excluded, it really is a pretty important acronym, so make sure that you've got that uh, at your fingertips through our session today. Uh, section two, uh, 9.2, it goes through the procedures, the lender and HUD staff responsibilities. Uh, lender responsibility is uh, basically to provide all the information that you need in order to do your review. And then the HUD staff responsibility is to independently evaluate all the, all the environmental exhibits for compliance with all the applicable laws and authorities and also make a site visit. Uh, the preparation of the Form 4128, also HEROES, which is basically the way we're going to be going in the future, uh, that's actually one of our responsibilities. And uh, also getting the necessary signatures um, from the HUD reviewer and, if required, uh, the regional environmental officer or the field environmental officer if there is uh, more than 200 units. So this is um, a little more information on the Section 223F uh, purchase and refinance. Um, I'm actually going to skip it. I think it's better if we go through this in more detail uh, later on. Uh, Section 221 D4, these are new construction projects or uh, projects that have substanti substantial rehab. Uh, for projects like this, we need to go through the full review. There is no uh, categorically exclusion, excluded option for this. Uh, so when you have any type of a sub-rehab in a floodplain, um, and uh, the definition here is if you have um, a project that will have an increase more than 20% uh, in units, um, it, will be, uh, it will not be a conversion from non-residential to residential. Anything uh, that, has, that meets those requirements will not have to um, meet the floodplain requirement. Uh, and then floodplain requirements will have, to be, will have to be met when you have new construction that do have conversion from non-residential to residential or uh, have more than 20% increase in the number of units. So Stefan, does this mean if you had a substantial rehab in place with significant rehab within the units, but you were not adding any units, um, and the project is currently in a floodplain, uh, would it be eligible to be, re to, to be recapitalized as a sub-rehab? You're not adding any new units. Well, no, it wouldn't be, no, if not, not if it's in the floodplain right now. Okay, so it's in a floodplain and it's currently insured and you're doing a sub-rehab um, and there's no new units. Is it treated the same as a 223F or is it? Uh, it's treated the same as 223F with a requirement that you have flood insurance. Okay, great. But if you were doing a sub-rehab and adding new units uh, and it was more than 20%, then you would be subject to just as if it was a new construction. Yes, and then you have to go through the eight steps. And I think uh, one of the, when I, what I'm trying to do here is kind of just, just introduce these topics, but I think we're going to go through this a little more in a little more detail later. Okay, great. Uh, section 224, uh, 1D4s, these are again new construction and sub-rehabs. Uh, we need to meet historic preservation issues. Uh, noise abatement issues, all these requirements will have to be met uh, in order to, um, to get these projects approved. Um, now, site contamination is another issue that we find when we talk about um, multifamily projects. Uh, when you have a phase one ESA that there, in, indicates that there is a, a recognized environmental condition, uh, sorry Dan, I'm, I'm using acronyms again. So REC is recognized environmental condition. That would be worth writing down as well. That is worth Definitely writing down. I hear that one a lot. Yeah. Um, so if there is a, a REC, a recognized, a recognized environmental condition, um, HUD determines that there is a, HUD might require a uh, phase two. Uh, a phase two is an actual site visit with testing. Uh, they're going to be. There has to be sampling. Uh, there is. There has to be um, a way for us to understand the uh, how big the the recognized the, the environmental condition is. Um, also, if there's going to be an issue of vapor encroachment or vapor intrusion in our uh, building, uh, the tier two uh, vapor encroachment screen. That's a, a ASTM standard on how to do. Uh, vapor encroachment, that has to be part of the phase two. Uh, vapor intrusion assessment is also required and uh, you can uh, proceed directly to mitigation or you can have what we call um, the, the, what, we, what would be a remediation plan. So basically the phase two might, uh, must, might conclude that you have the requirement of a remediation. 
um, a remediation plan will have to be will have to have a complete site characterization of all the contaminants and determine the extent of these uh, contaminants, how far they, um, they are on the property, if they are beyond the, the bounds of the property. The, uh, also the exposure path pathways and uh, any receptors for anybody that would live um, potentially in the future on this property. Uh, the remediation plan might require a complete cleanup. Uh, we do have an option for risk-based corrective action. Uh, that was something that was added to the map guide um, in the latest version. And what we allow through this is we allow the property to be developed uh, with some type of a partial cleanup as long as we understand that the people that are going to be there in the future will not have any uh, potential uh, exposure to any contamination. So that's why we call it a risk-based corrective action. A risk-based uh, corrective action um, will have to be approved by us. Uh, it cannot determine if complete or incomplete removal. Um, it would have to de determine if it's viable, and if it's not viable, uh, if it's more, it's too expensive to clean up the property. Uh, we might require um, just this, this risk-based uh, correct, corrective action. Um, and again, that's something that has to be approved, pre-approved by us. Uh, it must meet all the requirements of the MAP guide and uh, also be uh, in compliance with uh, the ASTM guide. Uh, we can have engineering controls, uh, basically some kind of a cover on any um, contamination. Uh, it could be a membrane, uh, concrete or asphalt pavement uh, covering the contamination, basically preventing any exposure. Uh, we can also have a vapor barrier and there has to be some type of a, um, a, a monitoring plan for future uh, reference in terms of how uh, the contamination, if it's still in place or if it's slowly dissipating. And actually, I'm going to end this here, and this is going to be part of my uh, next presentation. OK. Um, let's just take a break for a second before we go to the next segment where Liz will take. And at this point, are there any questions? And if we could. Um, uh, uh, give Laura a chance in our control room to uh, tee up if there are any questions for the panelists so far. I'm going to take that as <laughs> there are no questions at this point, and we will turn it over to Ms. Liz Peta. Thank you. All right, so, oh, oh, now we got our note that there are no questions. Yeah, no <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now we're going to step kind of way back um, and start at uh, the very high level here. Um, so the NEPA, or the National Environmental Policy Act, sorry, my Siri decided to start kicking up there. So uh, that's a good time to put away your phones. Um, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, or NEPA, is kind of the umbrella that creates uh, the environmental review framework. And this applies to all federal agencies. So we're just going to start with a really high level overview of that. Um, this might not seem relevant to you and what you do in your work life, but we think it's important to get the background of why we do environmental reviews um, and what the goals and legal requirements are to get us started. So I'm just going to spend 10 minutes or so uh, going over the big picture background on NEPA, and then we'll get into more about how to apply these concepts to HUD projects. Um, so forgive me if I'm a bit repetitive here as we get more and more specific over the next couple of days. So NEPA, I'm trying to avoid acronyms, but NEPA is the one that you'll just hear a lot. So we're going to go with NEPA uh, and avoid hearing me stumble over National Environmental Policy Act over and over again. Uh, NEPA does several different things. It establishes a national policy to encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment. Uh, it also established the White House Council on Environmental Quality, which we call CEQ, uh, which is responsible for administering NEPA and coordinating federal environmental initiatives. And it also requires all federal agencies to do two things. Uh, first, all agencies are required to follow an interdisciplinary decision-making process to evaluate environmental impacts. 
Um, and that's the environmental review process that we're going over today. Um, so preparing an environmental review is the process of analyzing and documenting all of our activities, their alternatives, and their impacts, and ultimately making a decision about whether to use federal funds on that project. So you're taking a close look at this project um, and asking whether this action makes sense at this site in this way and whether it's something that the federal government should be supporting, funding, sanctioning. Um, the second thing we're all required to do is to develop agency-specific environmental review procedures. And at HUD, that's Part 50 and Part 58, as well as Chapter 9 of the MAP Guide. Uh, CEQ, or the Council on Environmental Quality, also has regulations that set out basic requirements uh, that guide how all agencies must complete their environmental reviews. And HUD's regulations refine those to tailor them specifically to HUD programs and the kinds of projects that we do here at HUD. But CEQ's regulations still apply on top of ours. The key requirement is really to have an informed, thoughtful decision. Uh, NEPA doesn't require any action to eliminate all environmental impacts. It doesn't require a specific outcome. Uh, but agencies are required to consider, evaluate, and minimize their impacts. So NEPA is really all about the process, not necessarily the final outcome. So NEPA establishes the process and the framework for environmental reviews. Um, at, it requires environmental reviews for all projects with what we call a federal nexus. So at HUD, that's pretty much anything we fund, insure, or otherwise approve. Um, everything funded with federal money is run through this environmental review filter. So theoretically, everything we spend money on down to buying office supplies has an environmental review on it. Then within that framework, uh, we look at a host of environmental factors required by a variety of acts, executive orders, regulations, policies, guidelines. Um, and these can consider environmental impacts from a variety of perspectives. So for example, the National Historic Preservation Act and the Endangered Species Act require us to consider whether our federal actions will negatively impact historic resources or endangered species. And then kind of on the other side, our regulations on contamination policies and floodplains um, ensure that our projects aren't placed in locations that would be unsafe for our residents. So it's important to take this kind of holistic approach. We want to look at the impacts and the effects from all angles. We believe that there are a lot of good reasons to do an environmental review, um, and that this process really has a lot of real world advantages and uh, positive outcomes. So obviously, it's required by law. Uh, for some of us, this is the reason we're doing it. Uh, but it's still a really good reason to care and make sure that you're meeting all of these requirements. Uh, failing to conduct an environmental review or doing it improperly can open the project up to litigation that can slow or stop the project. And the penalties can vary from law to law um, and depending on the severity of the error. But these can get pretty significant. Um, the Endangered Species Act is probably the strictest one. And you might know about some very high profile projects that were stopped by the Endangered Species Act. Um, it can also result in criminal penalties if you do it really badly. So compliance is important. Um, and then in addition to these legal consequences, there can be financial consequences of an inadequate environmental review as well. Um, spending money on a site that turns out to be contaminated or in a floodplain can turn out to be a very poor investment. Um, and cleanup or dealing with a flood disaster can, of course, be extraordinarily expensive. Um, an environmental review done well is just going to lead to better projects. A good environmental review ensures that the project has been designed in a way that's the best, the safest, the healthiest for everyone, including the residents, the community, and the environment at large. Finally, environmental reviews should be meaningful to the public. Uh, these are public documents. They should be legible, plain language, and concise as possible. Uh, if there is a legal challenge, the environmental review record will be the document showing that HUD made the right decision. Uh, the record should be sufficient to support our position and show that we went through this decision-making process. Um, this shouldn't be a paperwork exercise. It should be a meaningful look at the project that leads to better decisions and better projects. Timing is crucial to the environmental review process. Environmental reviews are intended to be planning tools. So if you do the review after it's too late to change plans or adjust the project, 
there's little value to doing a thorough environmental review. Um, as Stefan mentioned, uh, for that reason, we have really strict rules about when the environmental review must be conducted uh, to ensure that it isn't moot by the time the environmental review is done. We're going to spend a few more minutes on that later on. Um, but until the review is complete, no action can be taken that would have an adverse impact or even limit the universe of reasonable alternatives. Again, it's important that this isn't just a paperwork exercise. We're not just writing up a document and filing it away, but actually making sure that these decisions are enforced as well. So NEPA says that all agencies have to condition their grants, permits, and approvals on any required mitigation measures. And for purposes of this training, that means that the firm commitment needs to address required mitigation. Um, if any mitigation measures or conditions are put on the project, uh, you need to either ensure that that is complete before commi firm commitment is issued or condition the firm commitment on completion of mitigation. NEPA requires us to take a big picture view of the project we're evaluating to consider the full effect of the project. So we aggregate and consider together all activities that are connected and cumulative. We also consider possible alternatives to the project as proposed, including the no action alternative, alternative possible actions, which we realize is not always a possibility for the types of projects you're looking at, um, and just making alterations to the project, including mitigation measures. Finally, we need to consider a range of impacts, including the direct impacts, indirect, and cumulative impacts when we do a NEPA review. And our next few slides are going to go into more detail on alternatives and impacts, and we'll talk more about aggregation later on this morning when we talk about project descriptions. SNEPA requires us to consider alternatives. Uh, you might want to consider different sites, different designs, a different action altogether, um, or something sim as simple as changing the time frame. In the context of FHA multifamily projects, I know that you're not often going to be able to get the applicant to change the location or decide to do a different type of project altogether. But design alternatives are something that you'll be able to consider. Uh, for example, you can adjust the plans to mitigate for potential harm. The other alternative that you really have available to you is the no action alternative, um, basically the option whether to approve the project or reject the project. It's an alternative. We have three types of impacts to consider, um, and the next few slides are going to go through examples of each type of impact and how they might result from a new multifamily housing project on a previously undeveloped site. So we'll look at direct impacts, the obvious caused by the action occurring at the same time and place, uh, the indirect impacts uh, that might be caused by the action but a little further in time or in distance, but still those that are reasonably foreseeable. And then the cumulative impacts, those that incrementally build up um, as a result of the project. So if you're doing new construction, the direct impacts are going to be fairly obvious. Uh, filling in the site, maybe eliminating that land as potential farmland or forest land, if that's what it was previously, whatever its previous use is, you've now directly uh, taken away that use. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, but you'll also need to consider the indirect impacts, um, which might include increasing traffic in the surrounding neighborhood, um, increasing stress on infrastructure, or requiring the creation of a new gravel pit or a new road. There's a lot more examples of that. Those are the three on the slide. Uh, and then also, uh, we have cumulative impacts. Uh, these are more complex and a more significant impact when you get into multi-phase projects. So one new building you know, creates somewhat more strain on infrastructure, on roads, um, and each subsequent phase adds that much more additional strain, um, especially as new businesses, new services are built up in response to those new housing. You also want to look inward at the cumulative impacts on your project. So a project might have more than one adverse environmental impact. Uh, for example, if you're building affordable housing in an area with elevated noise levels and site contamination, then you're getting into an issue with environmental justice as well. Uh, these can add up. So think about how these are combining with each other. 
Okay, so that's it for the very big picture NEPA requirements. Uh, now we're going to get a little more specific with how we apply the broader NEPA framework to HUD projects under our regulations at 24 CFR Part 50. Um, something we like to point out at Office of Environment is how similar HUD's mission is um, to the missions and goals of NEPA. Um, so the Housing Act of 1949 says that you know, our mission is to provide a decent, safe, and sanitary home and suitable living environment for every American. Um, if you compare that to NEPA, um, which states that its goal is to uh, declare a national policy which will encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment, uh, to promote efforts which will prevent or eliminate damage to the environment, biosphere, and stimulate the health and welfare of man. There's a lot of similarities there. So we think that the environmental review process is really a, a great tool to ensure that we're meeting HUD's mission of providing that safe, sanitary, healthy homes for all Americans. A very important uh, purpose of our environmental reviews is to you know, fulfill the goals of NEPA and the goals of HUD's mission. Um, you know, we're both protecting broadly the environment and public health um, through taking a look at impacts on wetlands, on air and water quality, on historic properties, um, farmlands, endangered species, all of that. Um, and then in protecting our federal investment and residents by looking at toxics, contamination, explosive operations, noise impacts, floodplains, airport hazards, making sure that we're providing safe, healthy places to live. Now at HUD, we're a little unusual because we have two different regulations governing how we implement NEPA. Under Part 50, HUD um, performs the environmental review itself. And we also have an alternative procedure under Part 58. Um, under Part 58, a unit of general local government assumes HUD's environmental review responsibility. Um, we call these parties uh, responsible entities. And under Part 58, responsibility for decision making and action that would otherwise go to HUD goes to these responsible entities. In programs where Part 58 applies, uh, which include most programs in community planning and development and in public housing um, and Indian Housing, uh, Office of Native American Programs, HUD's role in the environmental review is very limited. But so, so in the Office of Housing, almost all of the environmental reviews that we're responsible for are on Part 50. <laughs> that means this inherently governmental responsibility is done by HUD staff, specifically you. Um, now, there is one exception, and that is in the risk share program. Uh, those are delegated to the state housing finance agencies under Part 58. There are some risk share pro uh, projects, however, that are subject to Part 50, and we'll be addressing those in risk share training separately. Thanks. Yeah, we're not going to worry about Part 58. I think after this slide, it's never mentioned again. <laughs> okay, so today is all about Part 50, which again is 98 or 99 percent of the environmental review that HUD multifamily production is responsible for. Thanks. Um, so under Part 50, um, any partner including lenders, applicants, consultants, contractors, third-party providers, public housing authorities in the case of RAD, uh, may initiate the environmental review process by doing a lot of the analysis and legwork for HUD. Um, however, HUD is ultimately responsible for the quality and completeness of the environmental review, which includes responsibility for independently evaluating all documents. I think you're going to hear the phrase independently evaluate a lot over the course of the next couple of days. Um, and then certain aspects of the environmental review, like contacting tribes or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, can only be done by a federal employee, so HUD has to do those things themselves. Finally, it's critical that all findings and decisions be made by HUD and no other party. Uh, Stephen and I have both already mentioned this, but uh, we really can't overemphasize the value of starting this process early. Um, some aspects of the environmental review can take a long time and it can be difficult to predict where these problems will arise. Um, I think all of us that have worked with environmental reviews for more than a year or two can name a project where we thought the environmental review was going to be pretty easy and then surprise there turned out to be a completely unexpected issue 
um, that substantially slowed down the project, whether that was a historical resource that required extensive consultation or a site that turned out to be more contaminated than anyone had expected, um, a location that turned out to be a habitat for an endangered species, uh, presence of a nearby rail line that made the site so loud it required a waiver. Um, any of these things can take months and months to resolve. And you really don't want to come up with that realization at the last minute when you're getting pressure to close on the property in two days. So part of this conflict is a strict rule against choice limiting actions prior to completing the environmental review. Um, of course, there's a prohibition on taking any action that would have a negative environmental impact before the environmental review has been completed. But there's also a prohibition on taking actions that would limit the choice of reasonable alternatives, um, such as entering into a contract to buy property. Once you've made that commitment, uh, that cuts down on your alternatives and your options and kind of negates a lot of the purpose of the environmental review. So lenders and their partners can't do anything that would narrow the options while the environmental review is ongoing or before it's complete. Uh, to clarify one aspect of that, I get a lot of questions from people who want to sign a contract or close on a property um, on a certain date. And they're always looking for ways out of finishing the environmental review or for ways of marking it complete without really finishing it, um, like trying to condition their signature on just finishing up one last thing. You know, They just need to get one letter from the State Historic Preservation Office or one little thing like that. And that never works. Um, it really needs to be final before it's final. Liz, in our world, never is often an <laughs> ambiguous concept that really means the beginning of the discussion. Uh, do you really mean never? I suppose it's possible there's an exception I'm not thinking of, but I'm going to say never. Yeah. I think it means never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. never. Yeah. <laughs> say that. Um, so a critical aspect of the next couple of days is going to be talking about what needs to go in your environmental review record. Um, a well-prepared environmental review record is really critical to compliance. Uh, this is the document that actually demonstrates that the environmental review was done and was done properly. Uh, the public has a right to review this document, and it would also be the document that would be used to defend HUD's decision and actions in court if necessary. So it should be made with those things in mind. It should be plain language, written in terms that a layman can understand um, and will be familiar with. The format of this record just changed um, for you all in the audience. <laughs> Previously, we used the 4128 to document Part 50 reviews, uh, but now that has changed with the new map guide to Heroes. So Heroes will be the format um, going forward for Part 50 environmental reviews. Throughout this training, we'll be defining the specific documents and analysis that should be going into your environmental review record. Um, I think for the majority of our presentations, uh, at least from Office of Environment, our last slide will be a summary of what should be going into that record. Also clarify a little bit of terminology that can get confusing. Um, environmental review record is the documentation that you did your environmental review. So those are practically interchangeable. You'll hear environmental review and environmental review record. Um, it's just the record and documentation of the environmental review process. Uh, this is also somewhat distinguished from, say, the environmental assessment, which is a type of environmental review. Uh, and more on that this morning. So your documentation of the environmental review record um, should be clear, concise, and meaningful to the public. Um, again, our purpose is not to generate paperwork, uh, but to foster excellent action. Um, that's in NEPA. Uh, your documents should concentrate on the issues that are truly significant to the action, rather than amassing a bunch of needless detail. So any document that you include should be credible, verifiable, and relevant. Um, by relevant, we mean it should be concise and pertain specifically to your project under review. So in your Clean Air Act analysis, don't include the full state implementation plan. Um, you know, if, if at all, include just the part that's relevant to your project. Uh, people shouldn't have to go digging through hundreds of pages of material to find the one relevant paragraph. Um, this is especially important, say, if your field or regional environmental officer is reviewing the project, 
if it's an environmental assessment with over 200 units, they're going to read all of that. So you can really speed up the process by just giving them the stuff they need. I think I have just one more slide on this. Um, again, as a cold reader, whether it's the public, um, a newspaper reporter, a court of law, or your field environmental officer, they should have enough information in your environmental review record to determine whether your conclusions are based on sufficient evidence. Um, I think the biggest mistake I notice in environmental review records is that what they're saying isn't wrong, but that the environmental review record doesn't speak for itself. Um, so make sure that you're getting your reasoning and your thought process in the record to back you up. Um, I think just fairly recently I, I looked at an environmental review record that looked like they were just drawing conclusions out of thin air and making things up. Um, but then when I asked follow-up questions, I realized they actually had put in the thought and they'd done research and they had reasoning to back it up. They just hadn't put it in the environmental review record. So I didn't realize that they actually had well-reasoned conclusions in there. Um, but if it doesn't make it into the review record, it doesn't count, especially, again, if, if there's a litigation involved or a challenge. Um, so make sure you're getting it in that record. You aren't going to be required to be an expert on every single compliance factor. That's why consultation and collaboration are both central to an, a lot of aspects of the environmental review. What's really important is that you know where to look and who to work with to develop a high quality review. And there are many points where it's going to be necessary uh, to bring in an expert. The most obvious is the phase one environmental site assessment, which will always be conducted by an environmental professional. Um, and we'll go through exactly what that means later this afternoon. Uh, but where you get into trouble is that the person who prepares the phase one will often be a junior staff member at the firm, um, since this isn't a huge money maker for them. So they'll frequently be relatively inexperienced. And then even worse, that person might also attempt to meet all of the other requirements we put in our environmental reviews at HUD. So you'll get someone who knows a little bit about site contamination, but knows very little about HUD's noise regulations or floodplain regulations or wetlands um, or endangered species historic preservation, and they'll try to do all of this themselves. You don't need to take their word at face value. Um, you do have the option and the obligation to question their assumptions and their work and ask for more if you think the documents you've received don't meet our standards. Just add a little more to that. Uh, HUD is legally required to independently evaluate all documentation and analysis. So you are responsible for the quality of the third party provider's work. Uh, not all contractors are created the same. Don't take their word as gospel. Um, if you're concerned about the quality, ask for help from technical support in determining if you need to ask for more. HUD is responsible for this analysis, and if we get bad analysis and bad data, then the quality of our whole environmental review and the project can suffer. All right, now I'm just going to move a little more into resources since we're going to throw a huge amount of information at you over the next couple of days. So you're not going to absorb it all. You're not going to be an expert at the end of tomorrow. Um, it's important to know where you can get more information and answers when you inevitably have more questions. This is our website, uh, the Office of Environment and Energy's website on the HUD Exchange. Uh, it's a really thorough resource. We update it constantly. Uh, right now, we don't have too much tailored to you all in multifamily housing as an audience, but it's something that we'd like to work more on in the future. Um, there are a lot of re really good resources here, but I just want to draw your attention to some of the most important for you all. Uh, we have our contact information in the Office of Environment. Uh, next here is the link to the Heroes page. I think that actually moved up to the top of Featured Topics slightly. Uh, so that should might appear slightly different location on the page. Um, this has our training materials, frequently asked questions, which we update constantly, uh, short videos, as well as links to Heroes. Um, so hopefully pretty much anything you would need to use Heroes. And then really important um, is this link to view resources um, under the related federal environmental laws and authorities. So if you click on that link, you'll go to this page where we have an individual page on each of the related laws and authorities that go into an environmental review. 
so just to give a quick example, if you click on, say, Coastal Barrier Resources, you go to this page specifically, uh, which work has step-by-step -step instructions and links to other useful resources. Uh, at the bottom of each page, there's a link to a worksheet, which you can just barely see here. Um, and that worksheet looks like this. Um, it recreates our screen in Heroes in a Word document. So if you're working with a partner who doesn't have Heroes access, they can still follow the same logic as you will on the Heroes screen and submit their information in the same format. If you need to go to the Office of Environment for assistance, uh, please make sure you're going to the field or regional officer with jurisdiction in the project area, which may or may not be the person actually located in your office or closest to you since we're organized differently. Um, so just a little information on Office of Environment and how we're structured. We primarily act in an advisory role. We train people and answer questions about conducting environmental reviews. Um, and we review all Part 50 environmental assessments with over 200 units. Uh, but we rarely actually perform environmental reviews ourselves. Uh, there just aren't enough of us to get to all of HUD's projects. And we focus on training and technical assistance. There are about 40 of us in OEE altogether. There's a team of 10 in headquarters. We're primarily subject matter experts who focus on particular compliance areas. And you'll meet a few of us over the next couple of days. Um, and then your primary resource really, though, is the field. Uh, we have about 30 field and regional environmental officers around the country with local experience and local contacts. And they'll be your first line on any questions after technical support. Um, most of us, again, presenting in this training are from headquarters. Uh, we also have Laura Myers from the Fort Worth office uh, to provide the local perspective. Uh, so you'll be seeing a lot of her as she kind of provides color commentary throughout the day. Uh, so this map, I know, is probably not super legible on your screens. So we also have um, the HUD exchange to draw your attention to. Uh, this is what would happen if you clicked on that contact environmental OEE staff. Um, this is always updated. It has all of our contact information. Um, and there's a direct link to that in your handouts. Um, so you can visit that page and see who's near your projects. And finally, we just have links to a few more resources you might need. Uh, chapter 9 of the Map Guide. Again, a link to our website on the HUD Exchange. We also have a number of physical guidebooks on noise, acceptable separation distance, barrier design, and choosing an environmentally safe site. Um, and then Google Earth and Google Chrome are just really good to have on your desktop if you're doing environmental reviews. Uh, we strongly recommend downloading those. Google Chrome. Because of heroes? Because of heroes. Uh, if you're watching this in the future, <coughs> that issue might be resolved. It should be resolved in the summer of 2016. But for right now, yes, G heroes only works in Google Chrome. <laughs> um, and that is it for me. I think we might have so time we, for questions. We'll break. take a break in a few minutes here. But first, are there any questions? Laura, either post them if they've come in or just weigh in on the uh, microphone. Don't be shy and let us know if there are any questions. OK. And so Liz, do you want to field this one? Sure. So this question is, can you give an example of what is meant by maintaining the review record with the public's right to review in mind? Um, there's a couple things to keep in mind on that. For example, you should know in Heroes, we post environmental review records on our public facing website. Um, so, A, if there's anything that should not go out to the public, don't put it in the environmental review record. Um, the big example we use there is for domestic violence shelters, which I don't think is going to be an issue for this audience. Um, it could also be an issue, say, if over the course of your review you find tribal resources, certain tribal resources um, are. Um, confidential, and you wouldn't want to include those in the environmental review record. Um, but that will definitely be clear if it comes up in the project whether you should be um, keeping that private or not. Um, the other thing that I'd highlight there is, is to make sure that you're making a document that the public can understand. Um, even, you know, I, I've worked for HUD for six years, but every time I get thrown into a new program, I learn completely different terminology, all kinds of new acronyms um, and strings of numbers. 
um, especially so you all. So use use small words <laughs> and short declarative sentences so that I could understand it, and then you're good. Um, yeah. Liz, when uh, along the lines of the public review, this is one of the few exceptions uh, in our world when we're working on a project in the pipeline, just the mere existence of that can be disclosed, but virtually all of the information about that transaction is proprietary and not appropriate for a lease until we've issued a firm commitment. And then even then, we're releasing on our public website a kind of a skeleton. We do not release financial statements, social security numbers, a lot of this by law. And then under FOIA, we uh, claim exemptions as pre-decisional, any of the things that will ultimately be in the conclusion of the firm. Once a firm commitment is issued under FOIA, a lot of that information is releasable, uh, but not casually and not all of it. When does the environmental review in HEROES become ac accessible to the public? And for how long? The environmental review becomes accessible to the public when you press the archive button. <laughs> so after the, all the certifications are done and the review has been signed and approved, you'll be routed to a screen to press archive. Mm -hmm. um, and then that is the point where your review is marked complete in HEROES. Um, so so this would typically be commensurate or at the same time as the uh, uh, firm commitment is executed. Is that correct? I would think. Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, have the same person is approving the HEROES, the Environmental Review for HUD, that's signing the firm commitment, although uh, underwriters and tech support staff will be preparing the HEROES submission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great question. Any other questions? to answer Rick's question, it's then posted on our website for one year after it's complete. So it's available to the public for one year. The records stay in HEROES much longer than that. We have not actually established a records retention policy, but it's definitely longer than a year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Aaron? The IRS and the HUD MAP program <laughs> suggest seven years, so that might be a precedent, but you guys <laughs> let us know. Any other questions before we take a break? Well, um, at this point, it's 10.43. Let's take a break, at a, and we will restart at 10.59 Eastern Daylight Time, so that at 11 o'clock we can get back into our presentation. Thank you so much.